Hi there. Welcome back to the Mindset Check Podcast. I'm your host, Misha McKittrick. This is a podcast where we believe that as you take time for a mindset check, you have more power than you think you do. And we also believe here that as we go through life, we need to take time to take care of our minds. So before we get into everything today, take a minute and take a breath. Just breathe with me for a second and check into how you're feeling. How are you? I hope you're doing incredible and I really hope that this podcast brings you light and brings you stability and encouragement. In the first season of this podcast, The Mindset Check, we are reading through my journal. The journal that I kept as a 15-year-old as I tackled a few tough years of being pregnant and also losing my little girl. So we're going to be covering everything inside of that, all of the the challenges and, and breaking everything apart and really talking about kind of the nitty gritty of life. And what's really cool is that as we talk about these things, even though that might not be your life, neat things come up for you and you're allowed space to be able to think about your own life. Now in my journal, I know that we're getting close to due date. The last journal entry that we read was pretty close to my due date. And today's journal entry, let's see, is March 26th. So we are two days beyond my due date. We'll probably learn about that. I can remember feeling very um, anxious, very very frustrated because, you know, you mark that day on the calendar and you're prepared and you want it to come. And when it goes over, especially being pregnant, you're like, wait a second, what's going on here? All right, so let's dive in. March 26th, still nothing. Thursday, the wind blew so hard that part of the hardware store blew apart and landed on a brand new truck. Today, I'm going to Cedar with Paul and Gina to meet Jesse's mom. I just found out that my grandpa Cox is in the hospital with sugar diabetes. Now we know that sugar diabetes is on both sides of the family. Scary, huh? Well, they'll let him go home if they think he's okay. So we'll have to wait and see. Last night, Jesse couldn't sleep and got mad at himself at 4.35. Out of the blue, he said, Man, why do I always do this? Now watch, I'll fall asleep at 10 to 7, right before I have to get up. That would probably just wake me up more. Mm, crazy, but I love him. Let's, let's continue on and read March 28th. We have a doctor's appointment today at four o'clock. I can't believe this baby's not here. Well, we went to Cedar last weekend and got home yesterday. Well, last night. Grandpa might get to go home today, but I'm not sure. It was sad to see him in the hospital. I hope and pray he'll be okay. My mom, Linda, got the wrong impression last weekend. She wants to come and stay about a week when the baby's born and help out. When she asked if I still wanted her to come, I said yes, but I think we should wait till the second week because we'll have lots of visitors the first. Well, she got the impression that Jesse's mom was staying the first week and she the second, and got jealous. But she's holding it inside. I don't know how to tell her that if she came the first week, she wouldn't have the time she wants to stay with the baby and teach me things I need to know because of all the people and confusion. I'm afraid the only time I'll have with my baby is to nurse it. We have a two-bedroom apartment, and Gina and Paul have the same upstairs, 
Tanya, Derek, and two boys, Jesse's dad, Jesse's mom, and Walter, my mom and family, Paul's three kids, and maybe parents and friends and visitors. Now, what a full house. Paul's three kids are here and Gina. They were going to stay here with me, but they didn't. Everyone ended up going up the mountain and I'm here alone with no car. And I don't know anyone here. Good gravy. <laughs> Good gravy with an exclamation point. It's March 28th. I'm over my due date. <laughs> and I guess I'm alone. I don't know. Um, yeah, I probably didn't want to go. I don't know. I don't know. You know, when you're pregnant and your belly's big and you're uncomfortable and maybe they are going to ride four wheelers and stuff like that. I probably didn't want to go. I don't have a recollection of them like going and staying up the mountain, but actually maybe they did because they said that they were going to, I mean, I had said they were going to stay with me like in our apartment, but they didn't. So I'm unsure. I know I was 15 years old and apparently had no car. Milford was a tiny town. I mean, I don't think I was really worried about it because I did say that I had a doctor's appointment at four and I probably showed no signs. There's a little bit to unpack with my mom and the situation of just navigating through relationships. It's kind of a neat opportunity to introduce you to my grandpa Cox, who is one of my best friends in life. Yeah. Yeah, and if you can't tell, I stumbled quite a bit on all of those names, trying to rearrange them and give people a little bit of privacy. So forgive me if that was a little rocky. Let's go ahead and read one more. I know it's a, it's a three entry day. It's really short. I could tell. So let's just straight up March 29th. So this, the 29th, I know Taylor's birthday is on the 31st. So obviously it's just a couple of days before I'm going to have her. Five days overdue. Well, the doctor did say that the cervix is starting to ripen, thin out, and getting softer. In my words, getting ready. Last night, we went skating in Cedar with Paul and Gina and kids. Yeah, roller skating. And then we went and ate and came home. It was pretty fun and good exercise. Oh, I talked to my mom and everything straightened out. This morning... We went up the mountain and rode four-wheelers all day. The only thing showing was my hands and face. Well, they both got a little red, and let's just say you can see the difference in my hands and arms. Well, now we're home, and I fit in Jesse's Levi's. Believe it. They go all the way around my big belly, and they're not even tight. Now I'm just waiting to wear ones that don't sag. I'm so sick of all these loose clothes. Mom and Walter are on their way. Yes, I remember the the roller skating <laughs> the roller skating activity literally 5 days overdue, I won the limbo contest at the roller skating rink <laughs> on roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. I was just this little petite pregnant chick. <laughs> oh, if you want, I'll post a picture on my Instagram and you can see that. I can also post a picture in the show notes. I don't know if that's possible yet, so we'll cross that bridge. But if it's possible, I'll put it there. Just this cute little belly waiting, 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 waiting. But as you can see at the doctor, they say I'm getting closer and I know that I was feeling super excited. And I think we were trying to do a lot of things to, you know, m maybe, maybe most normal people when they are pregnant and overdue, they go for a walk. Right. <laughs> and I went roller skating and, and, um, 
riding four wheelers. Go figure. So as I mentioned, I wanted to sort of introduce you to my grandpa Cox because he is one of my very best friends in this life. And I thought it was kind of interesting to highlight a few things about our relationship. Most people, I think, probably wouldn't say that their grandparent is one of their very, very best friends in their life. And so I just wanted to illustrate how that came about and came to be so that you could understand the possibility for you, whether it's a possibility for you with a grandparent or with a grandchild. My grandpa, when we were younger, he was the kind of person who like carved whistles out of wood for us. He always had a big garden and he would take us out there with him and allow us to pick his produce and all of those kinds of things. We had dinners at his house. I mean, essentially it's both grandma and grandpa's house. And I had a great relationship with both of them. Um, but I don't know. I think later as I grew up, I did a lot of things with my grandfather. I did woodworking. After my daughter passes away, one of the things that helped me to heal, you'll see, is cutting out wood and, and working with wood and painting and some of those things. And I did those things with my grandfather's, you know, under his, his tutoring. And he would call me once I lived closer to home again. As I was older, I was an adult with more kids and he would say, Hey, Mish, let's, um, do you want to come over and pick and bottle beans with me? And I would do it. And it was just such a pleasure for me. I remember in college, I would go to my grandpa's for lunch. And it's interesting that those lunches were instigated by my dad. And so just take a minute to let that like marinate the power that you have in bringing people in your family together and see maybe what's possible for you. Because as I got older and, oh my gosh, my relationship with my grandpa is just so tender and dear to my heart. And he is someone who I would turn to for advice and just that really steady hand in my life. And I've had really neat experiences with him, um, both with him here and after he's passed away. So it's really neat. I also wanted to talk about the whole situation with my mom. And, you know, I mentioned that she wanted to be there when the baby was born and maybe she felt jealous um, and that she was holding it inside. So I don't know, obviously that was, if I said that she was holding it inside, that would have been something that I read into and maybe something that she didn't say. Um, and then I think it's interesting in the next in the next entry that I just kind of say, oh yeah, everything's worked out with my mom. I talked to her and everything's straightened out. And I, there's no further details as to how that worked out. Maybe there will be, I don't know. And I can't even remember looking back when she came. I just remember her desire to come. And so I wanted to really break down communication and, and talk about communication in our families. And the way that we see and hear each other, knowing like being a mom right now and knowing my mom as well and the history, I know that my mom has always just really had a desire to be there and be present when big things like babies are happening. And the desire of a mom is to, you know, protect and teach and be there for her daughter. And of course the excitement of a new baby and I think there's so many things to speak to around this because as the person that's having the baby, I think you're completely within your own right or your own bounds to say what it is that you want to happen, the way that you wish to see things kind of go. But I think that there's a very sensitive way that we have to manage expectations of other people and that's, that can be tricky sometimes. So I think ultimately we have to remember that 
as we communicate, sometimes the most important part of our communication is to actually hear what isn't being said. So how do we do that? It's not like we're mind readers, right? <laughs> I think some of the most important ways is to know your people, to know the people that you're communicating with and to ask really good questions. Sometimes knowing them is knowing what they're currently going through and understanding what's going on in their world that might be important to them. Like maybe if you understand that they feel left out or that they need support or that they need to be listened to, or maybe they need encouragement, understanding that helps you know how to communicate with them. Sometimes we can have a really good indication on knowing our people because of the things we've learned about them, like what our history has brought us to with them. There's really great things out there in this world. The one that is my favorite in knowing people and their personalities is called the Enneagram. And that is just a really neat and intricate system that helps you become self-aware, you know, of your own self and then how you relate and experience the world around you. And then you can know how your people relate and experience their world as well. As an example, with inside the Enneagram, I've had personal breakthroughs with my mom. This is, of course, later in life, far beyond um, when I was 15 years old. But learning my mom's personality, she's really laid back and kind of chill. And I'm, I can be a little bit intense sometimes, especially when it comes to confrontation or intense feelings. So what I've learned is that sometimes my mom would interpret me yelling at her when I'm actually just feeling a lot of passion for something. I'm not, I'm not really, really not yelling, but my mom, because of her personality, is going to interpret me in those circumstances and situations as yelling. Whereas someone else in my life that has a different personality is not going to perceive the same thing. And so understanding your person, where they're at in their life, and then also their personality is really incredible in helping us be clear in the way that we can approach them and the things that maybe they need to hear from us. Another thing that can get really tricky with conversations is how much we build into conversations that aren't real, things that aren't said, how much meaning we make about what's actually going on right? So you have something it's said, and then you also have your interpretation of it. And it's important to sit back and to try to separate those things out so that you can really understand how much of your story you're building into it, if that makes sense. I think this is one way to look at it is if you're really in the middle of a difficult sort of communication issue with someone one of the things that you can do is approach them like this. You can say something like, I'm a little torn by the way things went down. And can you help me walk through the facts of what happened without your feelings or my feelings? Can we just walk through what happened? And then we can talk about each other's feelings, but can we just walk through, you know, so you can really kind of lay out and see the story maybe from a different approach and not from everything that you're building in around it. That's your story or your, you know, what you're building in as truth. Um, and really allow the other person to say it from their perspective and what they're seeing. I love this quote by Jody Vera. It says, the issue isn't the issue. It's the way you're relating to the issue that's the issue. And sometimes we get so in the way and we get so wrapped up and involved that we can't even take a step back to see maybe the other person's side of the story. I mean, if you picture that I'm holding a great big beach ball and you're seeing one side of it and I'm seeing one side of it, I can describe to you that I see the colors on the beach ball 
and they're going to be different than the colors you see on the other side. And so I think it's important to allow the person on the other side to describe the colors they are seeing and for you to listen and to really show up in a way that you're not trying to just see everything from your own perspective. This is something that for me, for my personality, has been really something hard that I've had to work on and grasp as I've gone through my life. There was once a a short little film that was teaching a really cool um, perspective about this very thing that touched me. And it was a film about Godzilla. And the end, the credits, it was just a really short, like little takeout film. And the credits that roll at the end is where the lesson was. Because in the credits, it rolls that costume design was done by, and we'll just say Misha, because, you know, so we'll just say costume design was done by Misha, you know, screenplay was done by Misha, the audio was done by Misha. All the things that were in the film were done by one person. And I think that when we see it from that perspective, that's how we're going through life. We're going through life and we see every single thing. It's almost like we, you know, can put our hands up to the side of our eyes and that's the only thing we can see in front of us is just what's within that vision. And if we can bring our hands down, there's so much more going on. But unless we listen to the people in our lives, we don't get that perspective. We only get our single vision of what's right in front of us, what's always, you know, done by us. The biggest communication problem when problems occur is that so often we don't listen to understand, we listen to reply. We listen to be, you know, to defend ourselves instead of listening to understand and to love. Sometimes when we forget to see things from their perspective and what they're going through, we're missing a huge boat. You know the story in Stephen Covey's book when the guy's on the train and his kids are going crazy and they're running all over the train and this guy is just sitting there with a blank stare on his face and the observer is just, you know, in disbelief about this dad and how, you know, awful he is for letting his kids run all over and be crazy and all this stuff. And after having a conversation with this guy, the observer learns that their mother had just passed away and the dad is completely washed over with shock. And so he sees the situation from a completely different perspective. Instead of showing up and being really judgmental of this guy, he now sees him through compassion. And so it's really important to see other people, to learn to listen to them so that we can shift our perspective or put ourselves in their shoes and to really learn to communicate with them. And then finally, after we listen, we can talk. We can say what we need to say, and we can be really clear, much more clear after we've listened, and we can say our side. And we can expect to be understood because we just spent a lot of time understanding our person. So I don't know, going back to the whole situation with my mom, I mean, I'm glad it was really an easy thing. We worked out the confusion. I don't know more details about what happened, but I love that it was like, oh, we got it all worked out. <laughs> and honestly, like I said, I don't know what that looked like, but I hope looking back that she felt validated and that I was able to speak what I, my desire was, right? Another big thing about communication and experience that I had was when I was taking this marriage class for women, it was called Taming Jane. And the beginning of the class, she really encouraged us to say something every day to our man that was recognition or praise to say one thing every day. And I learned something very powerful through that exercise. I learned how much I thought good thoughts of him but I actually said very little of them. 
I didn't express them. And once I started actually expressing what I was thinking, it had such an impact on our relationship. George Bernard Shaw said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. You know, how many times do you get a text? I do this all the time. I get a text and I reply to the person in my head. And then I, later I realize, and sometimes I don't realize, but you know, you kind of go, oh shoot, did I ever reply? I thought through the reply in my head, but that's how fast our life is moving, right? And so sometimes our communication is like that. We think we said something, but we didn't. And taking the time to evaluate how clear we're being in our communication is a really important thing. Sometimes we forget to say things. And what's interesting is that as our families grow, we forget to keep getting to know our family members. And such an important level of communication and really knowing each other and knowing each other's hearts is really knowing them as they go through life. Because, you know, we know them and we forget to keep asking and keeping up on how your life really is going and what things are changing for you because we just know them. So sometimes I think as we communicate and we know each other, it makes navigating through hard communication easier when those things come up because we're human and we're going to have things that come up, especially in family relationships that are hard to navigate through. So spending time with our loved ones and making that time count, really continually getting to know them over and over is something that's a very valuable habit to form. So in making getting to know each other a little bit easier, I love crafting questions. Questions that will help you really get to know, get inside their mind and their heart. Like, what are you excited about? What are you hoping for? What do you currently love? What perspectives are new to you? I think it's really cool to think of a question or two or three that you want to ask or concentrate like during a dinner. I can put a list of questions in the show notes of things that I love and maybe they'll just help you think of things that maybe you want to have on hand when you're talking to your family. Remember follow-up questions like how so-and-so, maybe people in their life that are not in your life, but by keeping up on the people in their life, you're also understanding them better. You know, tell me what you're spending your time on. What would you do if you had more time or money? If you could will one thing to be different in your life, what would it be? Your family bonds are priceless and time moves faster than you think when you're in it. So building these relationships, it's interesting how it goes back to me getting to know my grandfather. Because yeah, it's important that in family relationships, we're present and we're there for people when they're young and when they're growing up. But it's really important for them to understand and to know that mentally we are here supporting them as they go through their life. And research shows that that strong family bonds contribute to good mental health. And so being able to form ways to work through hard, tough things, things that we have to communicate and then forming good habits around how to do that, super important. And then also building up our reservoir and knowing each other really well so that when hard things also come up, it's easier to work through and we can support each other better as we go through life. So don't be afraid to be the person who shows up and really instigates getting to know your family again. One of the really fun things that we did last year at Thanksgiving is something called family speed dating. Yes, I'm talking about speed dating, right? Where the, the time is actually going and you're trying to get to know the person across the table from you. But how cool is it that it's just your family? Because how many times do we get together for big family events and activities and the holidays are around the corner? 
how many times do we get together for those activities and we don't really talk to people who are there? Maybe we talk to a few, but talking to everybody, including kids, gosh, involving your kids in your family activities and your dinners and not just them running off to play, that develops them in a way that helps your the cohesiveness of your family so much and gives them such a reservoir to draw on as they go through tough things into life. So this is a really fun activity, family speed dating. And it's just a list of really fun questions, get to know you type questions. Yeah. So it's just a few sheets of paper that you can print out and you set the timer for two minutes. After the first minute is done, you switch and the other person talks on the other side of the table. And then a big timer goes that you switch and then you switch people and you end up talking to and getting to know, like re getting to know people in your family in really cool ways. So if you want that, I'll include that link in the show notes below. And if you're already signed up for my email list, then you'll just automatically get that through your email this week. I'll just include it in there. I think the number one takeaway from this episode is just to remember that it's through communication that we form bonds that cement us to each other. Communication is the thing. It's the one thing that allows us to know each other more, to feel each other more, to understand, to have empathy for each other and to help each other through life. And then the example from my grandpa, how those deep relationships help us navigate through life, whether that person is here navigating life with us or not. So just remember the value of getting out of the way in the conversation into a space where you can love, understand, and then be loved and understood on the other side. And it's in those things that we understand that through our communication, we have more power than we think we do. And Hey, I just want to say thank you for everybody who is sharing this podcast and helping it grow. If you think this episode will help someone that you can think of in your life, or maybe inside of your family, if you have a desire to grow those relationships and you want to share this episode with some of those people to encourage that, I would love that because it helps this podcast grow and to move forward. So thank you. And please, if you haven't already subscribed, then please do so. And don't forget to leave a review. Thank you so much for letting me walk through a small part of your journey with you today. And remember that saying amazing and good things to the people that are around us costs us very little and that we have power to speak words that help rebuild the torn down places in others. As we speak so kindly to others, it teaches them how to speak kindly to themselves. And that's power. As we build these relationships, through these powerful communicative skills, we enhance our own living. We bring more richness and fulfillment to our lives. It's worth it. Until next time, my friend. <laughs>